so again, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so this is the first uh, session uh, as part of uh, Machine Learning for Everybody series. So in today's session, uh, we will be uh, touching upon some basics uh, around machine learning. And uh, uh, yes, uh, I'll move on to the next slide. So just before I uh, go on much further, I just like to tell about myself a bit. So I started my machine learning machine learning journey back in 2020, uh, where I was working as a data analyst. So I started working first. Uh, sorry, Vibhav, uh, you have your hands up. Mistake. Okay, sorry. So I was working as a data analyst uh, at an e-commerce based startup. Uh, so I was predominantly working with Excel and SQL Server and uh, Tableau, some business, <laughs> some business uh, intelligence uh, tools. And uh, I was uh, slowly getting much more exposure around uh, uh, prediction applications. So I started le learning machine learning and uh, I had a very good touch with the community members around uh, working in the data industry. So I used to work with them with senior data members like Python developers and data scientists uh, and do a bit of text processing. So mainly it was uh, around natural language processing uh, in the beginning. Uh, so I can still remember uh, my first function that I was doing for text processing was uh, pre-processing text for uh, food recipe uh, the preparation. So it was some application that was something uh, really cool uh, that I applied natural language processing upon. So I wanted to get an official degree. So uh, I, I came here to UK uh, and did my master's of uh, MSc in data science at uh, LSBU. And during the summer, uh, I started doing casual research, and that is how I started getting uh, my interest much more into healthcare. And uh, I got a chapter published that was uh, uh, when I did uh, research on cancer. Uh, so it's in the book title, Explainable Artificial Intelligence in Medical Decision Support Systems. And uh, I also worked on a research uh, as, a, as a data research analyst at uh, LSBU uh, during my last months at the university. So that was a, quite another fascinating project where I had to create some simple rules uh, for the university as a guide to follow so that uh, they can get much more uh, uh, citations and uh, also uh, uh, much better uh, ref scores. So that was uh, another uh, interesting application using natural language processing and uh, general principles of machine learning. And uh, I started working at uh, NHS uh, so in 2023, July, and uh, it has been great so far. So who's joining us today? Um, so we have uh, audience from uh, uh, different uh, the varying skill sets and knowledge. So we have IT professionals uh, joining in, and we also have healthcare staff, clinicians, and other staff members working at NHS. And we also have some uh, other people who are, uh, as you very much curious about uh, new technologies of machine learning, and uh, they want to just uh, get a bit of exposure and um, uh, understanding of how things work around in. Uh, uh, in healthcare and machine learning. So given the wide range of audience, uh, please assume that uh, the session that uh, I'm going to cover uh, in the next slides is going to completely uh, be from scratch. So, it's, so if somebody who is an IT professional or somebody is a data scientist who's joined in and they think, uh, what's the benefit for me? I still recommend you to listen to it well, because my main emphasis is also on uh, uh, to think creatively so that, uh, so I want to emphasize on thinking much more than how to get around with the tools, that is what. And there are some learnings as well uh, from my experience and also from other uh, colleagues I've worked with uh, where we have applied uh, machine learning in real time. And uh, there are some lessons for you so that you can avoid some pitfalls. So definitely a takeaway for everyone who's joined in, in this session. Okay. 
so for today's agenda uh, we will get started first with the uh, introduction so that is the basic definitions of machine learning so that you be able to understand and be able to communicate or explain to others what exactly machine learning is and also look into some applications uh, of ml in healthcare and we will look into a type of machine learning that's called supervised learning uh, please ignore if you find this term a bit fancy and it's first time you're listening that's completely fine uh, we will uh, cover what it is in next slides uh, again uh, if there is uh, uh, there are some people who feel that uh, this is a bit of tech and uh, something that they never been with and it feels so far uh, what i can guarantee is that it is not really a rocket science and it's completely normal everything will be uh, just fine and uh, it will be a smooth sailing then we will look into regression what is regression and uh, what is classification some very classic cases that you often encounter in healthcare operations or any time you just see anywhere outside even in the ml space uh, i have a game for you so that i don't want to keep you boring so you can play with Um, or just watch me play so that will be a bit of fun activity and uh, that is a way uh, you can adapt and learn some cool concepts so that you can take away home and uh, i said uh, some key learnings from uh, data scientists and other members and my experiences as well so you can apply machine learning into your own uh, when you work with your own data set so you want to experiment with something new uh, we all know that Palantir Technologies is the new federated data platform uh, with NHS right now. So there is. So we will just get an overview. We'll look into what are some features and benefits of it of using machine learning. Uh, I have put a. Uh, I'll just try to make last five to ten minutes for a quick re recap. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, write down some keywords if you like, or also the questions. however this session is more like a interactive thing so if you encounter any time if you feel something's not clear you can just raise your hands up so somebody can follow along uh, the question so i can answer you then and then so please feel free to just stop any at any point raise your hands and uh, get it clarified then it then and then uh, it's absolutely fine no question is vague or anything you can just ask me anything uh, and uh, yes Oh, okay i think that was a mistake somebody put their hands up um so that is it uh, let's move on to the next slide then so just uh, a quick thing what you will get uh, by attending the session uh, as i said uh, you'll know what machine learning is and how you'll uh, be you can think of ways to apply applications in machine learning in healthcare you will learn some terminology well, this is super important why because when you are working with machine learning and also if when you uh, attend some other sessions uh, there is a bit of terminology that you should be definitely be aware of so that you understand what somebody is been talking about and learn what supervised learning classification regression and uh, Uh, how to navigate and use Google Colab? That is a notebook environment on cloud. So again, uh, nothing really too hard. Um, I'll uh, just make this session as much uh, uh, simple as it can be possible, and for you to understand. And uh, at last, with strategies uh, to deal with ML problems and and ML features in F2P. So. again uh, to touch upon the motivation uh, definitely before you start to learn or devote some time for this series or upcoming sessions that might happen so for the data scientists or data professionals uh, i would say that uh, this sessions might feel like a refresher for you and also stay updated with uh, and also look in and also it's like a new way to look into through things that i will be demonstrating here and for somebody who is uh, non technical um, so it's an exciting time for you why because you are part of uh, this new digital applications era and it also is very super important and uh, it's kind of uh, uh, gives you a uh, upper edge why because you already have the domain knowledge of healthcare so you can look through and try to connect dots uh, and uh, make up some nice applications so firstly uh, before i go and talk about machine learning uh, so 
I know uh, in the articles, newspapers, you often hear the first thing is AI. So it's a very, it's a buzzword. You hear AI, and um, there is also machine learning. So, so, so the basically machine learning is subset of AI. So, so why I say that is because. Um, um, so artificial intelligence is uh, basically a system that exhibits uh, human-like cap capabilities. Um, so what I mean by that is um, when, you, when you use some sort of intelligence and translate that into action, so the actions can be done by using some uh, robots or it can be, action can be any form. It can be through speech. It can be like a hearing thing. It can be something that responds back to you through voice. So some kind of intelligence. So that intelligence you can think as machine learning intelligence uh, that you are extending it a bit further, like you are connecting it with some sort of action. Let's say you have a robot that does some sort of sorting for you. It has already a some sort of rules or some sort of learning it has uh, during its experience. So based on its learning, it, it is doing some sort of actions. So uh, that is the most simplest way I would uh, describe artificial intelligence as. So one example of that is virtual assistants. Uh, you have some physical device you interact with, it comes back with you some kind of response. So, so that is one example of it. And within artificial intelligence, uh, as I said, there is uh, the subset is machine learning. Uh, as part of making the session a bit engaging, uh, what I want you to do is uh, read through this slide and uh, just for a minute and see if you can understand uh, the definition. So on one side, you have the very formal definition that is a bit more like in a scientific mathematical way. And the other side, I have written it uh, in very much simple terms. So if, if, if you did understand something, at least 20, 30% of it, uh, you can just clap or raise your hand. So do some sort of uh, uh, reaction in Teams so I can see uh, that you understood. Uh, great, yeah, I'm seeing some hands coming up. Right, uh, we will wait for 20 more seconds. Um. All right, uh, so uh, in simple, uh, machine learning is uh, when uh, a computer or any some sort of algorithm, it gets better by doing something more and more uh, just through experience. So when I say experience, it can be over a period of time that uh, you are uh, giving it a certain task and you are uh, making it familiar or you're exposing it with some sort of situation again and again. And uh, during this uh, learning experience, sorry, its performance, uh, if you are measuring it, uh, let's say you are you are measuring its performance with accuracy or something, then it keeps getting much better and better. Uh, however, if you still don't get it, uh, that's absolutely fine. I have uh, something that's written for you in much more simple than that. So basically, we have computers. So computers uh, have already a predefined set of software instructions inside it. So you don't need to rewrite it again, and you cannot modify it once that's done. Well, uh, if it's in a system like, say, you're operating a Windows or uh, any computer. Uh, so basically it has got some applications like Notepad or uh, Notepad or PowerPoint or Excel. The, those are already uh, have some sort of instructions in it. So in here, one thing to notice is that humans are 
already giving a set of instructions. Whereas in machine learning, uh, it's a bit slightly different where you hear the computer creates its own rules based on some sort of uh, inputs and outputs uh, that you show to it. Uh, what I mean is that, um, so the shift here is that uh, you, you don't want to write any complex rules, but you want uh, computers to adapt and improve over uh, a period of time with experience. Uh, so uh, this is some. Uh, this is the website I sometimes often visit, like uh, maybe in one or two, three months. So this is a very simple uh, BMI uh, uh, BMI prediction thing. So you enter your uh, height, you enter your weight, and you get your BMI. So that's the body mass index. And for deriving the BMI, so to get the BMI, there is a formula. The, that depends on factors like weight and height. And when you enter it uh, and you click on continue to get the result, uh, some sort of calculation happens behind that you don't see and it comes back with you with an answer. Now, let's say this is another uh, data set. So data uh, that has height, weight and uh, a BMI. So what I did here is, uh, what I did, uh, see, sorry, what I have here is uh, the index that zero means extremely weak, one means weak to normal, three overweight, obesity and extreme obesity. And uh, there is one more extra factor that is gender, that's male and female. Now, when it was just height and weight and uh, you could just plug in inputs, like put some numbers in the formula, uh, that is this one, and uh, you could just get the BMI. However, uh, as you keep on adding more factors, like gender, let's say, or maybe uh, you just want to add uh, waist circumference, you want to add in lots of other details that you have, and uh, you're not sure that depends on, uh, that does affect BMI or not, but you just have the data and you want to predict BMI. Now, uh, when things are very simple or you just have some sort of simple formula, it is very straightforward, straightforward, you get it. But when things get more complex like this, uh, definitely you want to, you don't, you don't know the rules first, you just have the data. So you want the computer to create the own rules. So that is uh, kind of a little intuition of what exactly machine learning is. So you have some data, you give inputs, and you you say this is the output. Can you predict when I give a new data point, uh, data, like if an, an extra record is male and some sort of height and weight, it should be able to give back some kind of index. Okay, that was uh, a bit of a basic understanding of uh, the, what, uh, how, a little of machine learning works, but how can we apply this uh, into uh, at NHS? Like uh, at NHS, we know uh, it's more around operations and also uh, clinicians working with. So in operations, uh, you might use virtual assistants that have uh, natural language conversations, uh, like uh, natural conversation style capabilities. Uh, that you know very well of, or if you don't know, that's again fine. Uh, or uh, you might want to do forecasting, like um, you want to uh, predict the uh, bets. So you, you want to make sure that uh, the bed capacity is just, just right so that you can manage efficiently as patients walk in uh, at the hospital or at any trust, for example. Or uh, it could be as simple as like, uh, let's say you are in a data team. Uh, this is not for uh, non-technical people. Again, uh, let's say you're in a data team and uh, uh, you have lots of patient summaries coming in and you want to structure them, like put them in folders, like you want to put put a tag to it. Okay, this belongs to cardiology, this uh, case, or this so this patient was uh, having um, uh, ed a specialty that they were referred to as cardiology or it was pulmonology or something, then you want to assign a tag to it. 
and you want to structure the records so that you can easily maintain them and uh, so again this can be done with uh, natural language processing or uh, some machine learning thing so these are few applications you can think of uh, that you can apply uh, or you could try to make more your uh, of your operations much more efficient and for the general staff for the staff and other cl clinicians who are working closely much closer to patients uh, so they can use machine learning to build some recommendation systems let's say uh, a patient walks in and uh, this patient has already come twice to the hospital and you have the reference of all the records and uh, and you know some information about the comorbidities let's say or yeah anything else and you want to tailor uh, some specific uh, great action nice action so that you can make uh, much more uh, 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 suggestions and advice and uh, make his treatment much more better or a radiologist can use machine learning uh, with partial human support so when i say partial human support it's like well still the radio radiologist does his job but uh, he can also use ai uh, on site so thus that does a bit of annotation to the mri scans or uh, cardiac images for example and uh, both can complement each other so that is uh, that makes much more uh, uh, elegant and nice way and improved way to do something and also let's say you want to predict uh, how some certain cancer uh, is been uh progressing so that that is something related to disease progression modeling uh again uh, if you have never heard of the terms or you feel something's uh, completely new to you that's absolutely fine this uh, this uh, the main purpose is to get more of exposure and this is for session so please feel free to just completely uh uh, not stress on something that you don't understand uh, i would encourage just to uh, expand and uh, emphasize more on thinking and how things can be connected and how applications can be put together uh, you don't really need to understand the uh, nuts and bolts uh, as of now for this so what i did was uh, i just made an architecture where you can put machine learning uh, in the healthcare space uh, again this architecture might not be 100% right and uh, in the sense you can uh, rearrange it uh, and reconnect it in different ways um, as in there are multiple ways to do it so patient walks in you have a triad system or some kind of initial system uh, assessment happening data you update in the data systems and then uh, there is some sort of black box that, that does some sort of magic so it helps the clinicians making some decisions it also helps the governance teams to make some improved nice uh, policies it does help the hospital administration at same time managing efficient operations like bed capacity thing and also uh, making the dashboards if they use so much more uh, actionable and uh, so this is just uh, again uh, an idea a concept kind of thing completely abstract um, just how you can uh, embed ml in the existing workspace some sort of big breakthroughs that are happening uh, around in healthcare um, in the world is uh, on to the on to the left i have a piece tech pieces technologies sorry so that is what they're doing is well they have written down 1 million autonomously written uh, clinical sum, uh, summaries so i think the, the emphasis here is more on uh, so that doctors and uh, uh, staff can spend much more time understanding with patient and um, uh, the machine learning does the job of writing the summaries and making a much uh, nice uh, 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 nice uh, keywords kind of summary so that uh, the doctors can look back into uh, and on to the right uh, you have captions um, sorry this caption ai um, the v scan air sl with caption ai so what they are doing is that they are uh, they are simplifying the process of uh, capturing the images and they are 
doing adding captions on top of cardiac images so this is a, some sort of computer vision application and this is some sort of uh, natural language processing application uh so well the possibilities are uh, quite many and what you can do with machine learning and uh, machine learning so there are uh, lots of ways uh, lots of things that you can do and uh, the opportunities are really and uh, and ways of developing applications are uh, endless so some terminology that i would like you to know before i move forward uh, move further forward is a data set and data frame um, so accuracy dimensions training data test data and model so when i say test data or data frame it, uh, so they both actually mean same thing and you will often hear uh, when you are working uh, as well uh, somebody saying uh, uh, referring to data frame or data set so basically data set is any data so it can be admissions data uh where you have information of patient uh, age you have uh, the pathway they came in the sub pathway and you also the discharge time and all these things and um, accuracy is like a measure of how well a model did perform so let's say a model is predicting uh, uh whether a cancer is malignant or benign so benign is uh, non cancerous and malignant is uh, something that needs attention to and uh, so uh, let's say you are using ai to uh, make much more better decisions and uh, it does its job well 99% of the time so you are assessing it with some data that you already know and comparing that the predictions were right or wrong so it's basically a measure okay and next uh, dimensions features and variables so dimensions is uh, the you can very simple it's the column names if you ever work with excel files or any excel file or any file uh, you just have column names like patient name nhs number then you know like uh, uh, let's say date of birth and lots of things so these are all called dimensions uh, well you can say column names why can't Uh, then uh, it is because it is just the way how you communicate uh, in this domain is just dimensions features uh, and variables so again these things are used quite interchangeably so just things to keep remember uh, but eventually with time you will you don't need to remember this you will get you once you start getting used to it training data and test data so training data you can think of like a student who goes to a school and uh, Uh, let's say he has studied all his year uh, he knows what the questions are what the concepts are so he basically knows everything the answers as well to the questions and the test data you can think of like uh, now he has studied all the year now uh, he has to go through some sort of assessment so you basically give the questions but you don't show the answers and you ask the student to predict so in here uh, it will the machine learning model that will be doing the predictions on the test data model uh, is like you, well you will hear lots of models uh, like machine learning model chat gpt model gpt model and uh, uh, very big uh, bus thing now so model uh, is i would say like uh, computers basically understand numbers they even if you say i have typed in my name so the number the name eventually gets converted to numbers behind the scenes so this some sort of uh, connections and uh, some sort of numbers put in a file you can think of in some sort of fashion so that it can work with some other application you can think that as a model the models can be different so the way of how things are the numbers are inside and the way the structure is can be different but the basic concept is same you can think of something that has lots of numbers inside it and when you give something the numbers does something with the data you give and uh, it comes back with an output let's look something uh, uh, on screen here uh, so i have this data set that i took from kaggle this is one website you can uh, refer to later and the bmi data set it has gender height weight and index so this is a data set okay and the variables or dimensions are the column names or the columns 
if I am just trying to predict the BMI using this three factors, so this will be my inputs that I will give to the model. And this is the output I will try to predict uh, with the model. Now, uh, for the machine learning, uh, like the model to learn something, uh, you need to give some, you need to give uh, some sort of training. So the training consists of the questions that is the inputs here and the outputs in here. So let's say you have 500. So well, the data set is of 500 records. So what I did is uh, I would say I want to uh, like take 80% of this data that is 400 records and uh, give it for training and the 20% that is one, one records I want to test or evaluate the performance of my model. So so it, so the main idea here is that you have seen what is variables, what is input, what is output and what is a data set mean. So that is something important. So uh, one sort, one type of uh, machine learning is supervised learning. So the previous slides that you've just seen, what you learned, like inputs, and that is the output and the training, that that falls within supervised learning. So in supervised learning, uh, you have labeled data set. So when I say labeled data set, so you have a data set, you also have the labels, that is the BMI answers here. And input is the training data. So this is the training data. Let's say 400 records I said is the training data. And uh, then you have output is the values you want to predict. So you want to predict the BMI given this some sort of inputs. So basically that is supervised learning. If you did understand this, uh, then uh, congrats that uh, you have understood uh, supervised learning. And this is quite something, this concept is super important. Uh, and uh, there are lots of uh, algorithms that rely on this approach. Uh, lots of many algorithms and forecasting, lots of other applications that you can use of using this simple concept. So once again, inputs and outputs, uh, you train on something, you hide some data, you test on something. That's supervised learning. Okay, so uh, some examples uh, I would give you is uh, in the healthcare context, uh, let's say you have admissions data and you want to predict pathways, like you want to know, uh, given a patient who comes in at any time, you want to predict which pathway does he come under, like pathway one, two, three, uh, like that. Or you might want to check or predict the readmission risk, like uh, what's the readmission chance of somebody who's been discharged. Or you want to also allocate or uh, do forecast forecasting that is predict how many beds can you have at certain period on certain time. So that is one example. Um, but there are some problems with this uh, limitations with this uh, approach. Uh, the problem is that uh, you need to have some good data quality. If you're not going to have very good data, then the algorithm might not learn uh, well and uh, the performance will not be something nice or decent. And so another thing is the data privacy. So as you want to add in more and more data, uh, you need to also think of uh, uh, what you want to train on. You don't want to take in some personal information. There are other constraints. Uh, in general, you know uh, what falls uh, as uh, under the category like data privacy and shouldn't be used kind of. And interpretability is something uh, super important in healthcare context. Why I say this is because let's say um, you have given some details of a patient and you and the algorithm uh, job is that to decide whether a cancer is malignant or benign. Now what happens here is that it just tells you the uh, patient uh, has 95% chance of um, uh, uh, having uh, the tumor that is uh, malignant or benign, but it does not tell you how it has come to that decision, how what made it uh, come to that conclusion. Uh, you don't have some sort of decision rules. But uh, luckily, uh, fortunately, we have some algorithms um, that does offer this kind of uh, help. And there are some other 
tools that can we can complement use with and uh, get some sort of interpretability bit, uh, with it. But uh, please do not expect uh, to have a very clear, uh, I mean, super uh, super kind of interpretability where you can understand everything. So uh, I want to take some time out, uh, like take a pause here and uh, I want to uh, stress on uh, studying relationships between variables. So I said variables are features, are the column names. So we just want to look uh, how one variable affects another and also how these things look on graph uh, because uh, you don't want to, when you communicate with something, uh, you just want to share information through some sort of pictures and things. So I, I just uh, switch. Uh, uh, to some other screen, so I can explain you this in much better way. So uh, let me draw a graph. So two lines. This is x-axis in maths and uh, y-axis again. Um, let's say you are flying from London to Hyderabad. So it's a city in Mumbai. Uh, sorry, city in. Um, India, the place where I come from, and uh, the plane gets off from Heathrow, and uh, they are climbing, let's say, 1,000 feet uh, every minute. Okay, so uh, so they start off from ground first. Okay, and uh, and uh, once they take off from the runway, uh, the plane starts to ascend. So I'll say. Uh, this this part is uh, time. Okay. I hope you can see this. Uh, just let me make this a bit much more bigger. So let's call this time um, that is going this way. And this is height or altitude that uh, altitude, yeah, uh, altitude uh, that plane uh, starts to climb. Uh, and we have, uh, let's say in here, um, we have uh, every minute. So I'll I'll start to capture like two minutes, and uh, then I'll make it here four minutes. And let's say we have one more here, six minutes. And we have one more here, eight minutes. Uh, you'll understand why I'm explaining all this very soon. So. Uh, after two minutes, uh, so as it is climbing uh, thousand feet every minute, so it will be somewhere here. Uh, let's say here it is two thousand. Um, yes, uh, it's uh, it's two thousand feet. This is the marker for it. And then you have here four thousand feet. Okay, after four minutes, and uh, six thousand feet and uh, eight thousand feet here. If you uh, notice something, uh, if I just keep going in this way uh, over a period of time, the points will continue to uh, go like this, uh, given the altitude at maybe 35, 40,000 feet, you won't stop. Then you won't go in straight line, but uh, ignore that part. Uh, so if you notice one thing, uh, I can draw a line like this first. Why? Because um, I already know that uh, if I move one minute, that is one step on this way, I'm going to go up by one 1,000 feet, okay? So if somebody asks you, can you tell me uh, the height after, let's say, 20 minutes, then you don't want to actually keep it drawing and uh, this side, I don't know if the screen will be sufficient to do that calculation. Just want to say, uh, you want to calculate it some sort of simple formula, okay? Again, ignore if uh, if I say you formula. So um, let's say, so I'll tell you how, one simple way, how can you calculate that? So let me draw one line here, like here, and one more here, okay? And uh, let's take one more here, and let's put one more here. Now, uh, the, math the mathematical way to do this is uh, 4,000 uh, minus, um, then you have 2,000 by uh, 4 minus 2. Uh, 
so what that gives you is um, 2000 by 2, that is 1000. Uh, so, uh, so what it means is uh, you started off at zero. Uh, so you want to predict height at altitude at any point. Uh, so what you do is uh, you say 1000 times, uh, let's say uh, after one minute, you just want to put in one here. So you know it's 1000 feet after one minute. And uh, after two minutes, it's 2000. And after three minutes, it's 3000 for 4000, 5000, like this. And there is one more extra term called bias or intercept that we say, but it is zero here. Why? Because it, it has completely started from ground zero. Let's say hypothetically, you, you have the ability to hold the plane in one hand, you just throw it maybe you want to throw it from 1000 feet height then uh, I, this might be 1000 in here okay uh, you might question why did i draw a line why not circle uh, well if i draw a circle things would not really make any sense why because i can see very clearly that as i move forward with time there is some sort of relationship with time and altitude as uh, time passes by every minute the altitude keeps getting much more higher and higher. And this is called linear relationship, very straight line, simple straight line. One, This is one factor. So altitude here depends on time. Why? Because uh, as uh, time is passing by, the altitude is getting increased and increased. Okay. So this is one simple form of regression problem. Okay. Uh, you can change this with something else and uh, you can apply your own application. Uh, sorry, I'll just come back to this. OK, now coming back to the screen in here, uh, we have uh, weights and index from the BMI data set. And uh, I have put weight in here and index in here, BMI. Uh, if, I, if you can remember that, just the example that I said with the uh, aeroplane, you can see, again, there is a linear relationship. Uh, you can see, like as weights getting more and more, the index, well, there is a particular index for it, might be that uh, higher obesity with six, okay? Um, so, uh, but this is just height, weight and index, so you can see weight in here and index in here. So this is a classical case of regression problem. If you have understood this, like uh, you know one, what to put on x, y, you, you're seeing some sort of uh, relation, like as things are passing by, you, you notice some kind of patterns, uh, then you can say, okay, I can apply a regression uh, uh, technique using machine learning on this data set. So you should be able to identify when to use this application, when to use uh, this uh, technique as well in your data set. So one another uh, way to find out if uh, regression is possible on the data set you have is that uh, your output that you want to predict uh, is of uh, uh, numbers, it is numerical. Like you have numbers ranging, I don't know, maybe minus, uh, uh, in between, let's say, minus infinity to plus infinity, so 5,000 to 10,000, any number that's continuous. Uh, continuous, I say 5.5, 6.5, 1.2, 0 0.8, anything. So you have uh, one variable. When I say variable, it's the column. Uh, you have is continuous type, number form, and on the x-axis that I said, this is the axis. You have, uh, th this should also be in num numerical form. Uh, very simple, numbers on both sides. Then uh, if you can see some sort of relation like this, uh, like you're seeing some sort of patterns, uh, then you can apply regression, okay? But one thing to remember in mind is that uh, uh, you can only visualize two things at once. You cannot, let's say if there is height, I, I, I didn't draw height here, but uh, the max you can draw is three dimensions at once. So three columns at once you can plot as a scatter plot. So this is a scatter plot. So three things at once you can, you can visualize. Let's say you have 100 factors, okay? Then you cannot visualize. So what you can do is you can just see uh, if your data has numerical outputs and uh, some sort of numerical input, then you can still apply regression. It's not always that you need to plot it and see. If there are lots of columns, like 100, 10, 15, 
uh, once after three, you cannot visualize it, so you can still apply regression. So let's look another data. So this is some sort of data. OK, this is some column age and this physical activity. Let's assume that uh, uh, this is a notional data again. OK, uh, this is unreal. Uh, let's say uh, as age tends to get more, uh, might be that you want to reduce your physical activity. OK, and uh, so you have a column uh, which suggests you need to have low physical activity and high for those who are very young. So what I did was I replaced high with uh, one and low with zero. OK, now you can say this is a number uh, like you have numbers down here, numbers in here. Can you apply regression? Definitely not. You cannot do that. Why? Because uh, I translated this uh, column into numbers like zeros and ones. Actually, it is not zero and one. This means something like one means high. Zero means low, but in here, uh, but in here you have indexes as well. But the thing is, uh, here you just have you cannot draw a simple line like this. You cannot draw a line like this. Even if you draw, um, the, what happens is that uh, uh, you just uh, can't make predictions when things to come by, uh, as it is a continuous thing. Okay. One thing to notice in here is that. Uh, here I have given BMI as uh, uh, have translated the obesity and other stuff just like that into two, three, four, some sort of number. This is just for your understanding. But uh, here I am seeing some sort of pattern, so I, I'm I can still apply regression, like I can draw a straight line here. But here I cannot draw a line like this. Okay. Uh, that doesn't make uh, really any sense, but uh, you can say I can I want to still apply. It will still work, but once you start, once you don't get any accuracy, you will realize, OK, this is not the way to do it. Then you come back to some sort of other way. So generally this this sort of like when you have some sort of binary values like zero ones sort of categories uh, that is generally a classification problem. OK, so Classification is something like uh, a patient walks in and uh, let's say you want to uh, decide whether he should stay in the uh, still stay in the hospital or he can be discharged immediately like yes or no or something like uh, what is the best service can you give to him like uh, or which specialty does it uh, belong to like pulmonology, cardiology, or uh, gastroenterology, something like that. Something to do with categorical columns to tell you in simple terms, OK? Uh, but regression, uh, clearly, it has continuous numbers on both sides. So this is how you can differentiate between what is regression and what is classification, OK? Uh, but uh, Things can uh, just cross the spectrum. Sometimes, like I have seen uh, some uh, people uh, uh, apply uh, regression when they wanted to do classification. That is lots of, uh, you know, a mathematical and a more uh, advanced way to look and different way to look into things. But for you, for now, it's uh, just for you. It's uh, super important that you just understand regression has to do with continuous numbers and uh, classification is something like yes or no thing or something you want to classify as, as the name suggests so directly. OK. Uh, I think Mary has put the link in the chat. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we will just look into some regression problem uh, using the uh, library of uh, Python uh, in the Google Colab. So I'll just uh, switch my screen. OK, um, you should be seeing something like this if you have the link. OK. So in here, uh, this is a Google Colab environment. So this is a notebook environment. OK, uh, where you can execute uh, uh, any programming language like Python and R, only two, Python and R, uh, you can run in this, and it basically requires you to have a Gmail account, okay? And it is free. You, you can run, save it, you can rerun it again anytime you want, and uh, you get 12 GB of RAM, 12, 13 GB of RAM, and uh, you get 100 GB of hard disk. 
You also have the ability to use a GPU that is for, ten, for a certain period of time. Uh, but again, ignore it if this is something new to you, not something really to bother about. And uh, you can uh, write even notes into this. So you can just write down some sort of text in here. And uh, this is my first notebook, let's say. And uh, uh, and you can just uh, execute like this. But uh, there is a difference between the code cells that you want to execute and uh, text you want to write. Like for example, I want to write this as a text. So what I can do is I just write it, click on text and write it down here. And uh, it shouldn't give me any error like syntax error. So this is a code cell. So code cell is something where you execute Python or R code. Uh, you have the ability to delete, uh, move up things down and uh, also run it. So uh, this is, a, if you see this code, you don't understand it. You don't really need to understand this. Uh, the main purpose of uh, running this is that you get some idea what regression is and how things work around. You just need to execute these cells, okay? So what this part does is it generates some 300 samples of synthetic data, artificial data. It gives height, weight, and uh, BMI, okay? And we are interested to predict BMI, okay? And uh, there is some sort of challenge first that uh, you have to manually uh, make a good line. Uh, I'll tell you what that is. So I'll just visualize how it looks like, uh, like see the data in uh, uh, graph here. So you have heights in here. So this is a straight line why? because this is height. So height is, uh, so people tend to have a high height in between well, the height here is in between 1.7, let's say meters to 1.9 max. So you're just seeing a straight line. But weight you can see is ranging between 40 and 100. And uh, you can see some sort of relation. Why? Because as weight keeps getting higher, uh, you see a, a BMI higher, okay? So we want to uh, draw one nice line. So as I said in here that, uh, well, here you already know the formula very clearly that uh, altitude was uh, uh, at any given time uh, you multiply with 1000, you get the uh, you get the um, altitude. So time times uh, um, time times 1000 plus zero was that. And um, time is at any interested period of time. Let's say 20 minutes. You want to predict the height of this aircraft. Uh, then you just plug in 20 and uh, into 1000 and you get 20,000 in here, okay? Uh, bear in mind uh, that you just, there is only one factor like time in here, okay? So you got one thing to predict and one was already zero, okay? But in here, you have two things like height and weight. Uh, in the previous example, you just had time, but you have two things in here. So now you need to predict uh, two coefficients, we say coefficient, or you can just say two things to predict, uh, and also one intercept, okay? The intercept uh, is something where you're starting off from, okay? Now, here the aircraft started from zero, so I said directly it is zero, but you don't know, we don't know what the intercept is for this, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, if you are interested, if somebody is so much curious to play with, then they can say, uh, well, I'll just play around and I'll try to figure out like you did here uh, with uh, putting, you just put in some numbers and just predicted. Can't I do the same? Uh, so the thing is here, uh, this is the actual BMI, the answers, and this is the predictions, okay? Now here, machine learning is not doing the job, but I'm uh, also giving you the option to play with. So you can see how I change one, how I how I'm changing something and how it is completely changing this line, okay? So the idea is that you want to fit this red line as much closely as possible, or you want to make the red dots fall as much close to this blue dots or might be that you just want to make them fall onto that, okay? If you go like a trial and error way, like this, okay? Oh, th this was a bit closer, but still far. Yes, Mary. 
Hi, man. Just conscious is three minutes left. Uh, um, I'm just going to wrap this up uh, very soon. Uh, yeah. OK, so uh, sorry, this is taking a bit long, but uh, uh, I'd be happy if you still bear me five, ten minutes more. And uh, OK, if I keep doing this, this might take long and I may never eventually converge at all with the right answer. Uh, but here uh, you can see that I just imported uh, the linear regression model directly. You don't need to write any code, just two lines of code I've written. And I said predict and it does fantastic job. OK. Uh, you can see it says this is the best possible line I can draw within in here. OK, um, so that is one simple example. And also uh, the idea over here was that you just can't get comfortable into uh, knowing these things and exposure and also that these things exist. Um, OK, moving on to uh, the next thing that is strategies in ML. As you have seen uh, that uh, I did mention of data a lot, and uh, I also showed uh, you lots of columns, and uh, I did mention of training data. I did some training, and uh, we said we want to predict something. Uh, there are multiple questions that can come up uh, if you're already working with uh, machine learning. So the thing is, uh, which algorithms to decide? Well, there are quite many algorithms. Uh, so like I said, uh, one thing is to be wisely pick whether it is a decide which type of problem it is either it is regression classification or uh, something else if it is regression what algorithms you might want to apply now that is an another question and how much data you need well in the examples uh, here i showed uh, you had 300 data points okay and in the other data set from the kaggle you had 500 data points and there are some other data sets with 10000 or more so does training make it uh, model uh, much better or much better better? Uh, well, it's not really the case every time. And uh, one more question is that should you spend more time collecting more data or you should work on it? So so the thing is you need to be aware that you have lots of choices to make. Even though Python does the job for you, you just wrote two lines of code and uh, Python quickly draw up a line. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you're a free guy and you just think, oh, I got machine learning because uh, I've seen year 12 quits or year 10 kids uh, run this cells and still replicate what I did. So the, the real thing is that is what I said is uh, from the beginning is to emphasize more on thinking and also just to know that these things exist and when to apply what is uh, something super important. So. Uh, so, uh, so first thing you want to start off with somewhere. Uh, so you just want to put in some kind of algorithm and see it works or not. You just want to don't want to think like oh, this is the end of the world. I'm going to only stick on this or this is my favorite favorite guy and I want him to work. So, uh, so and there is one more thing. No one size fits all. Uh, some algorithm might have worked on some particular data set. Doesn't mean it will work the same way on yours. So you have to experiment, play with some other things, play with different algorithms. So, the, so one might ask then, is it all trial and error? Uh, is it just all about experimenting? Then what's the purpose? I can just Google list and keep iterating the list of 100 algorithms. Well, you don't really need to do that. Uh, with time, when you experiment with lots of model, uh, you just get the knack of it. Like you will know, okay, uh, it has this many columns. Uh, it has, this is the output. This is the category looks like. This is the distribution. So it's, it's just a period of experience and time that you get more comfortable and uh, uh, you will know. Eventually, it is an engineering process. Why? Because when I showed you the data, I said about training data. I said about test data. I said 80% of data goes for training, 20 for testing. I also said that uh, you need to do some sort of cleaning sometimes, like in the BMI data set that I showed you, I mapped the BMIs to one, two, three, four, five uh, with some meaning. So there is lots of steps involved in it. But uh, in this session, I don't want you to know all of that, but I just want you to know that these things are all uh, in this field and uh, this is the process kind of thing. So, uh, so just remember that uh, everybody was once a beginner. I started way back uh, like in 2020 and this is my first page of the notebook uh, on the 13th July, you can see. So I just wrote the definition and uh, uh, you can see, uh, sorry for the bad handwriting and uh, you, you, you'll not even uh, believe that uh, 
uh, i was i was doing self learning and uh, uh, i had sometimes struggle on some couple of minutes of learning three days just to understand what that is so if you ever feel like uh, uh, i didn't get it in the first go or if you feel like this is something impossible uh, i definitely say that you stop i still want you to pursue and uh, engage uh, because things take time and uh, everything is really possible i uh, just need to spend take some time and work with um and last things uh, is that uh, the federated data platform foundry has some cool uh, feature that's called modeling objectives so it, it's uh, like uh, you don't need to have ml ops setup so this is something like uh, operations uh, and a bit of data scientist work and it complements that why is that because you can clean data okay you don't need to write code you can even do like uh, visually drag and drop stuff you can train models once you train it you can submit it for evaluation then you can deploy it and you can keep monitoring its progress and this is all done for you uh, with the fdp you don't need to have to create each process as a separate thing then deploy uh, and orchestrate and manage all this stuff uh, again if you don't know or you don't use this uh, that's perfectly fine uh, but this is one of the cool feature of it and uh, you get also the chance to import open source models you can uh, so open source models are something that already been trained on data sets so you don't have to start from scratch uh, every time or something that's been put on uh, for uh, commercial use as well so you can also train new models you can submit your own models you can host something that you already have let's say you have your own private model like you have your own private thing in within your trust or uh, hospital then you can host it you can containerize it so lots of features uh, within the foundry uh, uh, platform so it's very simple as well you can see it's very clear and uh, a bit visually intuitive as well uh, i have loaded let's say two models in here then i have the evaluation phase where i can just configure everything i can keep on adding more models okay i don't need to do lots of uh, python pythonic thing and also like write lots of code in here i can do releases i can do management all in one place uh, with this modeling objectives thing uh, so th this is the uh, so uh, this is the end of this uh, session as of now uh, i'll stop this no more uh, something that you would want to hear uh in regards to machine learning i think that is sufficient just as a quick recap i'd say that uh, i i i'm i think you would have felt comfortable or at least understood what is data data set and do you know what is a bit like machine learning you know what is relationship you know some sort of patterns you know what is supervised learning at least like you know i said the what are the inputs and the outputs you want to predict and you also know uh differentiation between what's classification and what's regression and some applications you can think of for applying uh within your uh workspace uh thanks everyone uh, i think uh, it just took more time than it should uh, but i'm really happy the, uh, that you stayed this long